Hi, everyone. My name is David Macklin. I am a family physician. I am a medical director of a behavioral and medical weight management program and have been for 19 years of my career. I also come to you today as an author of the 2020 Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Treatment of Obesity, of the behavioral chapter specifically. Obesity, which is a real medical condition and a disease, has three pillars to treatment. The three pillars are behavioral, medical or medication, and surgical therapy. And in my experience, most people know what medication and surgery are. But what still remains a mystery is what is behavioral therapy? What is behavioral therapy and obesity? And if you're interested in finding out the answer to that question, you're most certainly in the right place. Today, I will be talking about a knowledge translation of the behavioral chapter. And there are within that knowledge translation, eight modules. And today we'll be talking about the eighth module, which is called the resilience module. But today's objectives will be first, in about four minutes, you'll learn what the skill of resilience is and why it's a key predictor to long-term adherence to behavior change. Then over about six minutes, you'll learn about both acceptance-based therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and approaches to resilience development of each. And then finally, over five minutes, you'll learn how to help patients develop resilience in a really practical way, using the now well-understood ALSI method, asking, listening, summarizing, and then inviting and informing our individual patients with information that helps them develop, in this case, resilience. Adherence to any weight management program is a key to long-term success. When we study different diets head to head, we see that the success of health and weight loss is never about which diet someone was randomized to, but instead the level of adherence that they demonstrate to whichever diet they were randomized to. So adherence we see is an absolute key in weight management success. And we know that resilience then is a key predictor of adherence the degree to which participants are able to maintain the changes that they've made. And this isn't associated with weight loss and improved health. And it's a biggest predictor of adherence, which is the concept of not giving up, which is the concept of resilience. There are many definitions in social and psychological sciences around resilience, but it's really the opposite to giving up. It's when someone experiences a setback and they get back up again and they dust themselves off and they move forward and even maybe in the meantime, learn from the experience. So what would cause your patient to give up? What setbacks might they experience? Turns out there's really only three common setbacks in weight management. It's if someone finds themselves in the aftermath of an off-track overeating episode, one, two. If they find themselves in the aftermath of getting on a scale and seeing a number not in their favor, or three, if one is exposed to one's image in a mirror and a photograph and a reflection of a building, each of these setbacks may lead to negative emotions. Think of these as the three classic setbacks that you will review clinically with your patient. And so just a reminder, we as humans are automatic thinkers. So if a patient has tried to lose weight in the past and has failed, what is likely to happen is that they will have collected a library of thoughts in their mind that come again automatically, but these thoughts speak poorly. They come after a setback and they speak poorly about who the individual as a person is and also speaks poorly about that individual's capacity to get healthy or succeed in managing their weight. That's the characteristics of the automatic thoughts that then come to them. So we know, and this is a tenet of modern psychology, that thoughts lead to emotions and then lead to behavior. So if the thoughts are speaking poorly about oneself and one's capacity to manage one's weight long-term, the emotions that follow will be frustration and disappointment, anger, sadness, and even ultimately demotivation and resignation. And so these last, especially demotivation and resignation, you can imagine that those emotions put someone at risk of giving up. And so how do we build resilience? How do we help our patients develop resilience? Resilience may be built using both acceptance-based therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy principles or methods. Let's start with acceptance-based and commitment-based therapy or the ACT methods. 
Here described by Foreman and Butrin in a really great paper, I recommend you read a new look at the science of weight control, how acceptance and commitment strategies can address the challenge of self-regulation published in Appetite in 2015. Here they describe that certain internal experiences, think troubling and negative thoughts. We already described what these might sound like. These thoughts are aversive. Individuals vary in the extent to which they can tolerate or accept these unpleasant thoughts and experiences. Acceptance-based strategies suggest that adaptive behaviors depend on the ability to tolerate just such unpleasant internal thoughts and experiences. And so they recommend this concept called diffusion. Diffusion is an ability to distance oneself from unpleasant thoughts and feelings that could lead otherwise to overeating if they are acted upon. So what does that exactly mean? Well, let's use a metaphor. Let's say that a, someone in the aftermath of a setback is experiencing automatic thoughts. And think of those automatic thoughts as a storm of automatic thoughts, uh, a storm like a hurricane. And so let's think of there being two perspectives of how someone might experience a hurricane. If the autom automatic thoughts that follow a setback are aversive and unpleasant, if we find ourselves right in the midst of the hurricane represented by this reporter, in the midst of the wind and the rain, and their jacket is baffling and they're screaming into their microphone reporting about the hurricane that they are experiencing surrounding them in the moment, that becomes a very aversive and unpleasant experience. They're in the midst of the storm. In this case, the storm of thoughts that are negative and self-critical. And this can promote demotivation and resignation. So just consider another perspective. Here, also a storm, but a different perspective. In fact, from standing back at a satellite perspective here. This is the concept of diffusion. Again, the same weather process. And the metaphor works that if someone then is exposed to automatic thinking that speaks poorly about themselves, here we're asking individuals to develop a distance if they can distance themselves from these unpleasant thoughts. Experience, understand, notice that these thoughts are happening, recognize that they're happening, be ready for them to be happening, expect them to be happening. But when they do, understanding that these are the thoughts that come to my mind in these moments, and these are programmed from struggling with weight throughout my lifetime, this creates a, a distance, a potential distance. We would invite patients to just notice in moments of setback, off track days, Days the scale shows something if they choose to weigh themselves, something not in their favor, or even being exposed to their image, understanding that these moments can expose them to automatic thoughts that are self-critical and, and that these thoughts can create negative emotions and be invited then to just notice and be ready for them and distance oneself from them. Almost as if looking from 10,000 or 20 or 30,000 feet above, look how peaceful what is otherwise a very difficult storm looks from a different and higher and distant perspective. And what about cognitive restructuring and cognitive behavioral therapy, another tool to address and help a patient develop resilience? So the first step in cognitive restructuring is a process of discovering these automatic thoughts that happen post setback, recognizing them, hearing them, being able to capture what they sound like. Again, we know the category they can expect, an individual can expect, is thoughts that speak poorly about oneself and thoughts that speak poorly about one's capacity to manage their weight. The second step is then challenging these thoughts with evidence. And then a third step, which follows quite naturally is creating new lines of thinking, new what we would call resilience thought, resilience thoughts that are based on the evidence that we learned from the second step. So how do we discover the post setback thinking? We invite patients to go and notice, and this is thought best of as a funnel. We'll find that in the aftermath of a setback, someone will experience negative thinking. And think of different levels going down in a funnel down to a root thought. The top thoughts might sound like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. What was I thinking? Here I go again. And so you did that, what does that say about you? Well, it says that I'm weak and I don't have enough willpower. And the fact that you don't have enough willpower and that you are weak. Of course, we're not endorsing our patients' thoughts, but we're helping them recognize the thoughts they're having. If you are weak and don't have enough willpower, what does that say about the chances of you succeeding long-term? Well, it says, I, I probably can't do this. It's too hard. This won't work. And this then becomes what is called a root thought. 
A root thought many patients that I've met throughout my career will have in the aftermath of a setback is thoughts that ultimately sound something like, I can't do this, or it's not gonna work, or, it's gonna be too hard. I failed, uh, I'm failing, um, I can't do this. And these we would call the root thoughts. And we would certainly now understand the emotions of frustration and disappointment. And remember we said thoughts lead to emotions. So if the th root thoughts are, I can't do this, it's not gonna work. That's a very negative thought. And if it's believed, then the emotions of frustration and disappointment and demotivation and resignation are very understandable. And so in CBT, in cognitive behavioral therapy, the next step once we have found the thoughts is, well, what evidence do you have to support this line of thinking? And the most common answer someone will give if they think about it is, well, what do you mean, where's my evidence? My evidence is my past. I've tried to lose weight. I, uh, where do you want to start? Uh, there was that year and that year and that year and that diet and that diet and that diet. Each of them, though I maybe started successfully, ended up not succeeding. And so I have an open and shut case. Where is my evidence? Thank you very much, Dr. Macklin. And then the next question becomes really quite critical. We call it an ultimate challenge to their line of thinking. And the ultimate challenge sounds something like this. The, the question would be, well, if your past is affecting your present, the thoughts that you have now are affecting your current efforts based on your past weight management efforts, then let's talk a little bit about your past weight management efforts, but let's not talk about all of them. Let's just talk about your past weight management efforts where you were seeing a clinician specialized in weight management in a non-discriminating, information-filled, supportive environment, maybe using video technology so that visits are easy to comply with, combined with other professionals, maybe registered dietitians that are certified in bariatric education and in behavioral medicine and in medical nutritional therapy. And again, compliance with visit visits in a non-discriminating, information-filled, supportive manner, and maybe combined with an extremely effective medication that uh, is both safe for long-term use and directly addresses the single symptom that you struggle most with, uh, wanting, and a medication that you can use long-term, therefore, to manage the main symptom that you struggle with when you struggle with your weight. All the times you've had all those three things, for example, put together, how did that go? And of course, then the patient will say, well, I've, well, I've, never, I've never done that before. I've never um, um, had all of those things as, uh, I guess, what you call treatment. And so the reason I would have listed those concepts is because those concepts constitute what is treatment for someone struggling with their weight. That list that I described is simply treatment, uh, the effective treatment for someone who struggles with obesity. And so it brings up this fascinating question. The question is, then is it possible that your past is inadmissible evidence as to whether you can succeed or not because you've never once been comprehensively treated for this real medical condition. In fact, each of the efforts you've conducted in the past were not evidence-based and not effective. And so is it possible that your past is inadmissible evidence whether you can succeed in weight management or not? And so already there, just with that question, we're starting to challenge the root thoughts that an individual carries into therapy when we're meeting them. Again, the root thought of, I can't do this. What evidence do you have my past? But have you ever been comprehensively treated? No. Is it possible then that your past is inadmissible evidence and that everything can be quite different now? Yes. And so what does this mean clinically? So as always, we will be describing the practical on the ground tomorrow in your office approach to managing resilience using the now hopefully very familiar ALSI method, the ask, listen, summarize, invite, inform method. And so let's see how that plays out in resilience. And so when we ask how things are and we then tune our ear to self-critical thoughts, and thoughts that speak poorly about an individual and their capacity to manage their weight, a patient may say, oh, I feel defeated. You know, I can do well for a short term, but not a long term. I feel like I'm sabotaging myself. I'm just a yo-yo dieter, it must be. I don't think I have enough willpower. I'm either kind of on or off. If I don't see results, I really get demotivated. Maybe I'm just not motivated enough. Of course, then the next step is summary. And so we will summarize what our patients have told us. And this helps our patients understand that they've been heard and helps us clarify the dialogue that we hear, the clinical history that we hear from our patients. 
And so what you are telling me is, or correct me if I'm wrong, that you feel defeated. You feel like you can do well for a short time, but not a long term. And you're feeling like you're sabotaging yourself. And this is part of a yo-yo diet pattern. Maybe you don't have enough willpower. You feel that you're either on or off and feeling like you sabotage yourself. Even if you don't see results, you find that's a key time when you get demotivated. Is that correct? Exactly, the patient will say, if we've summarized correctly what they have been telling us. And then, of course, the last step is this key invite, inform uh, process. And here, a bullet point representation of this. And again, we're scratching our heads and asking, hmm, I'm wondering if you would consider the following. I'm wondering if you would consider that setbacks are very common and response to setbacks rather than the setbacks themselves really determines one's long-term success. The common setbacks that can happen in weight management are being in the aftermath of an off-track day or seeing a number on the scale that's not in your favor or even being exposed to one's image that can be a negative emotional experience. And setbacks you should know and would you consider are followed by self-critical thoughts that speak poorly about yourself and self-critical thoughts internally that speak poorly about your likelihood or ability to manage your weight? And would you consider that your work is in fact to simply notice and recognize and identify these thoughts? We've talked a lot in our practice about how we as humans are automatic thinkers, automatic thoughts that follow a setback. And there's two ways you could work at this. One, which is an acceptance-based therapy, is asking you, and you might try this, to simply learn to accept that these thoughts are in fact automatic and consider just distancing yourself from them, recognizing and understanding when they will come and noticing them and saying, oh, there are those thoughts. I'm feeling a negative emotion, frustration, disappointment, and anger. And this must be one of those moments where those negative thoughts are coming, like my clinician told me, let me notice these and understand that they are automatic and even consider accepting that they are long-term and that I will experiencing them. I will experience them. And that my job is to see if I can diffuse or distance myself from them, better tolerate them, understanding they will come and that they can go without affecting me negatively and emotionally. Another work you may consider is to actually, once you've identified these thoughts is to learn to challenge these thoughts and replace them with new ways of thinking. These are two skill sets that we can work on in behavioral therapy and in obesity management. If this is something you're interested in learning more about, we can start to talk about this today or book something soon to review not whether you're having setbacks. That's quite natural. I invite you to consider that's the case for everyone. And it's instead how someone responds to setbacks that determines their long-term success. And so resilience, this kind of skill that promotes adherence and long-term long -term work on this long-term condition, that really determines success. Is this something you'd be interested in learning more about? That's the invitation. Of course, as always, we provide a script that though not yet in your own words, allows you to have a real sense as to how to address the inform invite in the area of resilience. And over time, you'll develop your own words. So let's summarize. In summary, one, you have learned what the skill of resilience is and why it's a key predictor to long-term adherence to behavior change. Number two, you've learned that both ACT and CBT-based approaches can be used for resilience development and two methods that can be used to help build the skill of resilience in our patients, so critical. And then finally, you've learned in a very practical ask, listen, summarize, invite, inform method, or the ALSI method, you've learned specifically how in your clinical practice to help your patients develop resilience.